Hello and good evening. Alex Mark here, Stratford Vertical Plate Society Chapter President. Uh, tonight we have a special guest. Uh, he is the systems engineer on Dragonfly Flight, uh, Doug Adams, uh, AIAA Associate Fellow and member of APL's Principal Professional Staff. He received his BS and MS and PhD. Uh, from Purdue University, which is actually where I got my master's, great school there. Uh, more than 20 years experience, and prior to his work at APL, he also worked at JPL. Uh, a ton of uh, information uh, in your bio here, Doug, uh, so I won't go through it all, but if you want to be free. Uh, just want to mention that uh, you led the development of Dragonfly flight system over uh, the last five years, which is very impressive. So. Tonight is sponsored from Dassault System. I uh, can't appreciate them enough for sponsoring these webinars that we've been doing throughout the spring and uh, coming fall. Uh, for those uh, Sikorsky employees here, we will be doing our summer tech snacks this year. So look forward to some announcements coming in the next few, uh, few weeks around uh, the speakers for that. And also our uh, golf tournament is September 2nd this year. Um, so feel free to email myself or Wagata or anyone else if you're looking for information on the, the golf outing for this year. Uh, should be a great event. Uh, we have the Kenlock Challenge going on. Uh, so uh, read the flyer for some more information on, on what that is. It's very exciting that we, uh, we have something uh, surrounding the um, uh, charity event there for the golf tournament. Uh, and Doug? With that, I will hand it over to you. Appreciate you coming tonight, and uh, thank you so much. Really excited to see what you have. Absolutely, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and uh, it's a pleasure to join you. Uh, I'm very, uh, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, as you said, uh, I've been working Dragonfly since February of 2016, which seems like an eternity ago, uh, and in some ways it is. Um, but I'm gonna give you guys, um, I got, I've broken this uh, presentation up into a couple different parts. Um, first, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of the kind of the motivation. Why Titan? Why why send a spacecraft to Titan? And and you see the title, Robotic Exploration of Titan with Dragonfly. And for VFS, it's a multi -ro multi rotor relocatable lander. So uh, clearly, that's a, a topic of interest. But why Titan? And then how Titan? uh is the second part of the the presentation um and so we'll get get down to it so first you can see this image by the way i love this image on the right this is you see the little um honeycomb in the background clearly that's been superimposed but the the rest of the image is actually a real image uh the only thing that's been done to it is that uh, the the titan's been processed to um with real tools so it's it's not like a fake surface or anything and and that's pretty cool because if you look at it, you can actually see Salt Crater uh, in this real picture taken by Cassini, and we'll talk about uh, Cassini in a second. Um, but uh, pretty neat picture, and this is where we're going. So why go there? Uh, the and the principal attraction of Titan. First of all, it's a kind of a mysterious world. We've only ever gotten a, a brief glimpse of the surface, but we don't really know where life came from on Earth. We don't know our own prebiotic chemistry. Uh, and NASA has this origins program, and one of the big questions for the origins program is, where did life come from? And it turns out that um, places like Titan have frozen the chemical processes that may have led to life here on Earth. May, you know, we believe there's simil similar chemistry on the surface of Titan, and it's been there for four billion years. So strangely enough, we can basically go backwards in time on a chemical basis when we go to the surface of Titan. And in investigating the surface of Titan, we can get a glimpse of what Earth may have looked like four billion years ago before life uh, was formed here. So it's an extremely interesting science target and we're very excited about going there. Uh, just a little bit about Titan as a world. It is what's called an ocean world. Uh, there are a number of them, including Europa, if you've seen 2001, 2010. Um, but it has a, a water shell, a water ice shell uh, over a uh, rocky core that's about 4,000 meters, excuse me, 4,000 kilometers in diameter. And Titan itself is the largest of Saturn's 62 moons. Uh, it's about half again larger than Earth's moon, uh, a little less gravity than Earth's moon, um, about 14% of, of Earth's surface. 
But for us, uh, sending a rotorcraft to Titan, uh, the important bit is really the, the surface density. The pressure is about one and a half atmospheres, which is nice. It's close to Earth. But the density is where it really pays off. With the low gravity and the 4.3x density, uh, that's a major benefit to us. And it's uh, as you can see, it's a bulk nitrogen atmosphere, actually similar to Earth, uh, less the oxygen, of course. The other thing about it, though, is the atmosphere is extremely cold. Uh, it's very thick. You can see it's about 10 times taller than Mars atmosphere and about 10 times the column density of Earth. But it's very cold, 94 Kelvin or minus 290F, just above uh, liquid nitrogen temperature. So it's challenge. It's a challenge from a, an engineering perspective uh, to to fly on Titan. D just for reference, uh, with this group, the speed of sound on Titan is about 200 meters a second, where of course on Earth it's about 340 at sea level. So exploration of Titan, and again, uh, we'll just do a little discussion of, of how we got where we are now. When I was a kid. This is what we knew about Titan. We had this picture from Voyager. This happens to be from Voyager 2. And we saw this big cue ball, you know, this off-white, light, light tan cue ball uh, out in space. Um, but then in 1997, they launched uh, the Cassini-Huygens spacecraft. And you can see the Cassini spacecraft on the left here. And it's huge. It's about 22 feet tall. Uh, and the the dish that you see at the top is about 13 feet in diameter. The Huygens probe is about nine feet in diameter. On the right, you can see a couple of technicians next to the probe. And if you look in the background, way down here in the lower left, you can see a desk uh, next to the spacecraft to get some scale. So this thing is enormous, um, just a giant spacecraft. And we we launched it in 97 and it arrived in 2004. And then it spent 13 years orbiting Saturn and with a total of 126 close Titan flybys. And that's a big deal for us because what it what it did was it, it uh, did a number of things. First, the Huygens probe uh, entered the atmosphere, and this was technically an atmospheric probe. It was not designed as a lander. Uh, they always hoped that it would survive the, the impact with the surface and transmit photos, but it technically was an atmospheric probe with landing potential. And you can see the image it took from the surface over here on the right, uh, and it's in rough scale to the picture from the moon. Uh, taken on Apollo, uh, just to give you a, a sense of perspective. These cobbles you see in the foreground are roughly the size of a, a volleyball or maybe a, a large grapefruit, something like that. So Huygens went in the atmosphere and gave us a, a, a nice view, but of a single point. Like, you know, it's kind of like if you if you look in your front yard, that's more or less what Huygens showed us of, of the Earth's surface. But the other thing that Cassini did for us is, is it had specialized sensing equipment. In this case, um, they were able to use that sensing equipment to, to look in the infrared wavelengths and see through that very thick, hazy atmosphere to the surface. And again, weirdly enough, Sulk is right there. It's, and again, Sulk crater is our objective. And what that allowed us to do, one last plug for Sulk right in the middle, is uh, you know we map the surface uh, in infrared and you'll notice what looks like a brown belt that kind of goes around the, the equator of, of the moon. And that is uh, the equatorial dune sea. And we'll get to dunes more in a second. But uh, that's, that's important for us because it's, it's not silicon sand like we would have here on Earth. It is hydrocarbon sand. So the, the atmosphere of Titan has about 5% methane. And when that methane interacts with ultraviolet rays, it, it ra basically rains hydrocarbons onto the surface. So the the kind of crazy thing is, is when you explore Mars, you're looking for hydrocarbons on the order of parts per billion or maybe parts per million. And on Titan, we're swimming in hydrocarbons. The whole surface is covered in it. So uh, the reason the salt crater is so interesting is because you can see there's a melt region around it. So that icy surface was impacted by something. We don't know what it was, an asteroid, comet, something. But something hit the surface and caused a melt region that flowed out and mixed with these, this hydrocarbon sand sea and created aqueous hydrocarbon chemistry, which is perfect for looking for early amino acids or early indicators of what might lead to life. Uh, we don't expect to find life on Titan because Titan, it's so cold, but it's very interesting from a chemistry basis. The other thing that was done, and, and these are radar passes, it's a bit of a swimming image to look at, but if you look very carefully, again, you can see silk, you can see some really good radar coverage of the surface <laughs> of silk. Um, and, and, and it's from this that we know uh, what's on the surface. These different radar images 
uh, when looked at individually, show us things like this, the organic dune sea. You can see these large linear dunes, uh, not unlike something we see here on Earth. And I have some pictures in a second to show you that. But other things we see include uh, river channels. Titan has a, an, a, a liquid cycle, a uh, methane cycle instead of water, but it's a hydrological cycle like Earth. So you have rivers and, and, and you also have lakes, uh, polar lakes that are very interesting because they're Unlike Earth, when methane or ethane freezes, it sinks to the bottom. So there's a kind of a strange cycle there. And if you look very closely in the lower right, you can actually see, I, I hope this movie's coming across, but you can actually see some clouds moving around on Titan. So there are, there's atmospheric uh, phenomenon that, that similar to what you would see on Earth and very interesting place. Okay, so again, the, the, the key here is there are three ingredients that you need for life as we understand it. You need an energy source and on earth that can be the sun or some sort of photochemistry. There is also life that is uh, chemosynthesis based on, uh, you know, that's at the, on the subsur uh, excuse me, at the ocean floor, for instance. So you need energy, you need organic material and you need liquids and on, uh, and, and a liquid. And of course on earth that's water and on Titan it's methane, but there is also water as I just discussed in that melt region on the surface. So some ways that you could explore this, how do you explore Titan? Well, there are a number of ways that have been proposed. Uh, as early as 2000, Ralph Lorenz proposed using a helicopter. You can see airships, a hot air balloon, uh, an airplane that would stay airborne the whole time. Uh, a splashdown sea lander was proposed. Um, there were also some flagship studies, but but the, the trick is that, you know, if you imagine something that's lighter than air to explore Titan, well, in order to interrogate the chemistry on the surface, you need to land on the surface. So you have to convert a lighter than air to a heavier than air lander and then vice versa. Rovers are not ideal because of those dunes present, uh, dunes and other debris in, in the crater impact region present a problem for wheeled vehicles to get through. But a rotorcraft is perfect because it can take off, fly and land and we can do pinpoint landing uh, with a priori selected targets and get around on the surface and cover great distances to really see the moon. So that's what we have. And this is a, a you know a mission on a slide overview of what uh, what we're what we proposed and are now uh, preparing to fly, uh, which is the Dragonfly lander. You see it in its cruise configuration on the left with a cruise stage and the entry vehicle. And of course, we kick off the cruise stage before we hit the atmosphere. We'll show a video later of this. See the lander tucked up in the aero shell here. Uh, and then we descend through the atmosphere and start to fly. Uh, just note at the bottom, this is this, when you go to outer planets, you have to be a little patient. We launch in June of 2027 is what that should, should say, sorry, it's 2027 and arrive in uh, November of 2033. So it, it's about a six and a half year cruise. Uh, and that's on a very large rocket. That's about as fast as you can get there unless you go to something extremely large. Just a couple highlights of the lander itself. Uh, the first thing is that one of the enabling technologies that we're planning to use is an MMRTG, the same power source that's currently powering the Perseverance rover and the Mars Science Laboratory rover Curiosity on Mars, the very same unit. And it's housed in this insulated shroud on the back of the lander, again, to protect from the cold. The whole lander is uh, bathed in, a, in an insulation to protect from the, from the the bitter cold of Titan's surface. Uh, there is a high gain antenna. This is a radio line slot array antenna that's used to, to do what's called direct to earth communication. There are no orbiting assets at Titan, unlike Mars, where they're able to do UHF links to orbiting assets and, and high bandwidth data, data downlink to earth. We have to transmit everything directly to earth. And then of course there's science instruments that we use to, to perform chemistry uh, and other experiments on the surface. And one of my favorites is we take aerial images uh, that we can report back to Earth as well. So getting around Titan, um, one of the nice things uh, that, that's offered to us, and one of the reasons we're interested in this dune region, again, here's a close-up of the salt crater you can see in the middle of the screen. And you can see some of these uh, fingerprint linear dunes in, in the high-res radar down here. Well, what we know from Earth analogs is that the interdune region, the areas between those dunes are very flat, very smooth, and basically ideal helipads for us to, to land in. So that's our, the reason we selected the dune region to land in is we know that the terrain there should be 
hospitable to us uh, and that we can land safely and then traverse across the surface to get the Titan, excuse me, to get the cell. And there's a particular desert on Earth called the Namib. You can look it up on Google Earth. It's in Southwest Africa that has these beautiful linear dunes. And you can see the comparison between the Cassini radar uh, on the left here and the Namib dunes. And, and it's just quite clear that that's what we're dealing with. And here's the, the interdune region on Earth and kind of a, a scale to show how easy it would be to land there. But getting around the surface, one thing you have to remember is that uh, we're more than a light hour away from Earth. So there's no hope of joysticking the lander. We have to have it fly on its own. So we don't wanna have a repeat of having the lander have to find its own landing site every single time. So what we've done is we've uh, come up with this thing we call a, a leapfrog strategy. And the way this works is that you prime the pump. The very first thing you do is, let's say that your first landing is in the green area here. Uh, so you know all about this, right? You you've landed there, you have images of it from the air, you have images of it from the surface, you know where to go to. So what you do is you take off from that, you fly over, take some pictures without landing, but you take some pictures of a new site, the blue one here, and then you come back and land where you know it's safe. And so now you, you downlink that data and say, okay, where, we wanna, where do we wanna fly? We wanna, we wanna go land next, to, you know, in this little circular flat patch that's near this interesting looking colored rock or whatever it is on the surface. And then the next time you fly, which is you take off and you actually deliberately fly past where you intend to fly, scout a new site, and then come back and land where you intend, where you previously selected that you want to land. So this way, it's a two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back, so that we can traverse across the surface and cover great distances without ever having to require the lander to pick its own landing site. It will also be going to a pre-assigned, it will always be going to a pre-assigned landing site. So this is how we are able to land. You know, we're currently planning 40, 40, 40 flights on the surface. And this is how we, we believe we can execute these uh, over the course of the three-year surface mission without incident. Um, so some fun stuff, uh, again, uh, for the vertical flight uh, community. We have a 14 degree freedom system that we're, we're using the model right now, with a rigid body in the middle. And then of course the, the uh, eight rotors that are spinning to, um, to fly the vehicle. I didn't mention it before, but you'll recognize this as an X8 system. The reason we selected an X8, there's a couple of reasons. One is it gives us more lift when we're in forward flight. The rotors actually, uh, you, you get a benefit from having more rotor area. And recall, we have to pack this thing in an aero shell to get it into the atmosphere. So we need that rotor area. It also gives us the opportunity for redundancy. If you lose one of the rotors, you still have the ability to execute a, a reduced mission with the remaining seven rotors uh, in play. Um, so how do we test that? And this is kind of the fun stuff. This, so, so now we're, uh, this is one of the, the issues that we're working right now is we, how do you know it's gonna work when it goes to Titan, right? You know, it, you can't just do it in a computer. You have to do something, you know, in, in test. So what, we've, uh, what we're planning to do is uh, what's shown on the screen is to go to the NASA Langley Transonic Dynamics Tunnel or the TDT. It's a wonderful facility that allows us to test in heavy gas. It's refrigerant 134A. And it does a very good job. It's not perfect, but it's very good at matching the aerodynamic properties that we need for the rotorcraft at full scale. So that's what's in the table below. It's a little bit of an eye chart, but I'll draw your attention to the green part where it shows the ratio of the Earth Mach to Titan Mach, for instance, Earth tip Mach, uh, advanced ratio, Reynolds number and lock number. So it's very good. It, it, we can basically match one to one for, for uh, these three parameters. Reynolds number, we're a little low, but it's it's still high enough that that it, uh, we have a good good aerodynamic match, and the lock number is close enough as well. So it's a very good test. The one thing it doesn't do is hit temperature. Um, so we have another series of tests that we're gonna we have to do to to verify that the motor itself functions properly and cools itself. And we use environmental chambers for that, which is a but but it's not an aerodynamic test per se. It's it's more of a thermal power test. Um, this is just a, a look to the future. Uh, what we're hoping to do in our first entry is something, and this is not a, a perfect representation, but it's a representation of what we, it might look like in the, um, the TDT with our full scale rotors. We would put a pair of rotors in there to do our first tests. And then later, uh, when we get into later phases of the project, we're gonna do something, and now this is clearly not Dragonfly on the right, but uh, it's an example of when a, a, 
semi-span rotor craft. In this case, it happened to be a tilt rotor, uh, was tested in the TDT. So we'll have a unit that looks not dissimilar from that, except it's going to be Dragonfly instead of the unit that was tested here. Uh, and again, how we get around the surface, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that now, because um, it's not just a matter of of uh, having a good IMU. You have to have the ability to to navigate in order to to execute the leapfrog we discussed a second ago. You need to be able to go tens of kilometers and return to where you were. You have to, you know within meters. You know you can't be off by a hundred meters. You need to be off by a couple meters. So the way we do that is we have uh, navigation cameras, which are in the forward part, downward looking, and we have LIDARs. And the combination of the navigation cameras and LIDARs uh, gives us the ability to track ourselves across the surface the same way that a pilot might uh, fly using landmarks on Earth. We take images of things, we remember, we remember what those images look like, and then we're able to navigate to and from those. And this is just a, a quick view of, of all of the instrumentation that we have on board. And you can see we have the nav cams, the flash sliders, IMUs, inertial measurement me measurement units. Uh, we also have a radar altimeter velocimeter. Uh, and at the moment, we have ultrasonic al altimeters to help us with our final landing. We have pressure altimeters, which are useful on Titan for maintaining a pressure altitude when we're doing those traverses. So what I'm going to show now is uh, just a couple of little short videos that that kind of explain this whole process uh, of, of our navigation and what happens here for optical navigation i guess it's going to go ahead and play is you have an image that you just took the camera just took and it's on, on one hertz so every second we process a new image bang 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 you take the current image and you either either compare it to a previous image or you compare it the, like the the one that you just took a second ago or you compare it to a reference image a breadcrumb and the breadcrumbs are represented in the upper right by these green uh, square. So we're retracing our steps across the surface of Titan. So what you do is you take the current image, you resample it, you compare it to, the, you, you basically you warp it into the same frame that you took the previous image from, and you do a phase correlation, and then you map that phase cor correlation for quality. And if it's good, it's accepted. If it's bad, it's rejected. And what you'll notice is that in the upper right, uh, the blue is where we think we are, and the black is where we really are. The funny thing about this is, is that uh, even though there's an error here, even though the true state is, say, to the right by, I don't know, 20 meters or 40 meters, whatever that is, uh, we don't actually care about that because what we're tracking to is what we see. So if we're correlating to the images we took previously, then our navigated error to where we know we need to be is zero, even though our true error relative to, say, latitude and longitude is, is, is off. Uh, that's not important because we're trying to navigate back to an image. So as long as we're locked onto the images, then we're not lost. And this is how we get around without GPS, without a magnetic field, without any orbiting assets, uh, and without a map. We we just we fly off into the the wild blue yonder, taking pictures of the surface, and we're able to navigate back to where uh, from whence we came. The other thing that we have to do, though, and this is especially important for the first landing, is we have to find a landing site that's safe. And the way that we do that is we scan for it with a flash LIDAR. And what this little, little video shows is as we move along and we're flying at five meters a second or thereabouts, we're hitting the surface with this LIDAR at 10 hertz. And on, on a 10 hertz basis, we're, excuse me, on a one hertz basis, we're, we're, re, we're updating the measured elevation map that we have. And from that, we can derive a deviation and slope map and assign hazards. And you can see the landing sites that the lander would have automatically selected over this distance, which is about 100 meters, this place twice. Um, so the lander is able to autonomously make its own decision about where to land safely on the surface. And that's a, a key and critical piece of the whole mission. So this is the result of that. This is the number one site. It says this is the safest place to go. You can see the lander to scale within, you know, amongst the obstacles that it had rejected. Here's a hazard. It's one over here and over here, but it's safe where we went. And then number two and number three sites. And this is how we pick our landing sites when we go to Titan, at least the very first one. We'll use that same technology for subsequent landing sites to interrogate the surface and make sure that we're making a good choice uh, from you know when we pick a landing site. But the the most critical one is the first one because the lander's on its own and there's no hope. There's no way that we can uh, help it. It has to make the decision on its own. So with that, uh, I have a movie and I think Alex was going to play that so that it comes across in better quality. Um, do you wanna go ahead and play that, Alex? 
Yeah, Chris, I think, uh, Chris, you got that video. I'm right? sorry, Chris is going to play that. Yep. No, he's got it. Yeah, he's on we'll top. Start playing shortly. Okay. Thanks, Chris. All right, so this is some CFD that was done um, in in phase A. Of course, we're, we've got much more advanced CFD that we're doing now. We also did some rotor tests, uh, very early rotor tests. These were our early prototypes. Um, and we did some fun things, like we sprayed them with liquid nitrogen to show that the motors would work uh, at temperature. Um, and we also went out in the field, and this, you remember, one of our big challenges, uh, probably the number one challenge for Dragonfly is the, the autonomous flight navigation in particular. So we out, went out in the field with this um, early version of the drone. You see it's a quadcopter, not an octocopter, and, and flew these, uh, these navigation algorithms. And if you look carefully, you can see the little purple dots as we fly over the hay fields of Titan, uh, not far from APL here. And the vomit-inducing video on the right is what the camera sees as it navigates uh, using vis visual odometry. And, and uh, no space video is complete without a launch, so I have to show this video. It's a particularly fond one for me. This is the MSL launch. Uh, that's an Atlas 541, five-meter fairing, uh, and this was back in 2011. Uh, and it was very fun to see that. So <laughs> big rocket throws us into space. We actually have a different trajectory. This uh, this trajectory is the one that we had up until about two weeks, about actually last Tuesday, when NASA determined that we get to launch on heavy lift launch vehicle. But once we get to Titan, it's all the same thing. We hit the atmosphere at about seven kilometers a second. You see here, 7.3 kilometers per second. Uh, crazily enough, we deploy the drogue chute at 135 kilometers above the surface. Uh, 10 kilometers above the top of the Martian atmosphere. That's how thick it is. Then we fall through the atmosphere for about two hours. Uh, it takes us two hours just falling to get to four kilometers where we deploy the main chute. And then we execute a mid-air deployment. Uh, after we, we first we separate the heat shield, we arrest the, the yaw rate for the vehicle by spinning the rotors in, in the opposite direction. And then we perform a, a mid-air deployment that we call transition to powered flight to distinguish it from a mid-air deployment of say a glider or some other vehicle that doesn't require powered fly. So it's a transition to powered flight and then we're in powered flight. And this is where we descend to the surface to a search altitude. We use the LIDAR to locate a safe landing site and then the optical navigation to fly back and land at that safe uh, landing site, which you see here. Very carefully touch down and life is good. Uh, deploy the high gain antenna and talk to Earth, tell them it's all safe. You'll notice that there's cameras, th those two things that look like ears are cameras. They're the panorama cameras on the high gain. And the beautiful thing about Dragonfly is that we can take off and do it again uh, 40 times uh, over 3.3 years. And that is the Dragonfly mission in a nutshell. She looked at me and said, What did she say? And I said, She wants to know if you want any dessert. So that's everything I had. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I hope that. Uh, I know. If anyone has a question, if not, that's okay too. Yeah, I have a question. This is Bill Welsh. Uh, hi, oh, Bill. Uh, oh, hi. Hey, hi, Doug. Awesome, awesome presentation. Thanks, thanks a lot for doing it. It's a, uh, it's like red meat to helicopter guys. Um, I had a question on um, the flight testing on Earth. You, you showed the TDT, TDT testing. Are you planning on flight testing on Earth? And I'm curious if you are. Do you have a, how do you simulate the low gravity of Titan when you're when you're on Earth? So that's a good question. Um, the we suffer two things uh, on Earth. One is, one is the density, right? We're a quarter of the density that you would have on Titan. Mm -hmm. The other is gravity. It's seven times the gravity. So when you combine those two, it's very difficult. It's kind of like, you know, if, if you think about the Mars helicopter, flying on Mars is like flying on Earth at 100,000 feet. Well, flying at sea level on Earth is fly, like flying at 35 kilometers on Titan or something like that. I don't remember the exact number, but it's of that mm -hmm. ilk. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of meaningful flight tests that we can do, even if you tried to scale the inertia, um, the, the aerodynamics are all wrong. Uh, and 
So what we really have to do is we have to rely on the wind tunnel test to give us the data. Now we do do flight tests. You saw the the drone that had the um, the cameras oh, on right. the bottom. What mm -hmm. we called the uh, the drone box, which was a very dull name for a very important box. Uh, we have a much more much more advanced version of that now called the, the uh, integrated test platform that that has a, a flight like computer, flight like sensors. Mm -hmm. And it's big, it's it's so big it weighs 90 pounds and it has a tail number because it weighs more than 55 pounds. We had to get an FAA tail number and we fly that around in the field so that we can verify uh, our own control algorithms and our own navigation algorithms um, ad nauseum, very inexpensively to do that. Uh, but it's not, it's not relevant to flight dynamics per se. Flight dynamics are... Flight dynamics are something we're going to have to have to do with our deal with on our own, rather through uh, tests and simulation. And margin, yeah, thanks, Doug. Don't forget margin. <laughs> hey, Doug. This is Nick Lapis. Uh, hey, Nick. What an intriguing design. Nice job. What? What? Tell me a little bit about the power that you get off of the nuclear source, and then you must have some sort of a, a battery accumulator so that you can take bursts of power or higher gain. But you, you tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, great. And I apologize. I, I kind of glossed over that. You're right. Yeah, the RTG is great because it gives us both heat. It gives us, call. it's about the same amount of heat that you get out of a hairdryer, 1,500, 1,700 watts of, of thermal energy from the decay of plutonium-238. And, uh, and that's wonderful. Uh, it also gives us power on a continuous basis, but that power is end of mission power is on the order of 80 watts and clearly you can't fly a copter like this with 80 watts we the mass of the lander is on the order of one uh, statute tongue ton um very heavy lander but on, again one seventh on titan but it's still heavy and the uh the way that we get around that is we have a very large lithium ion battery same basic technology you have in your cell phone and we trickle charge it. So uh, the part I didn't get to is that Titan is in tidal lock with Saturn. It's it's like Earth's moon, uh, you know, same man in the moon, same side faces Earth all the time. Well, the same is true of Titan. And that means it's day, it, day night cycle is the same, diurnal cycle is the same as its orbit period, which is 16 days. And the only time we can talk to it is when Earth's in view. So basically during the daylight hours, there's about six days, uh, maybe a little bit more, um, six Earth days that we can talk to uh, talk to the lander on the surface. And what that means is that for 10 Earth days or the, the nighttime part of the Titan Sol or T-Sol, we're just charging the battery. And it's kind of incredible when you actually add it up, if you're squirreling away 40 watts uh, and you integrate 40 watts times you know 280 hours, you end up with a whole boatload of power that, or excuse me, a boatload of energy you can store in the battery. So that's what we do. We have this huge 10 kilowatt hour battery that we trickle charge with the, the energy that's coming out of the, uh, or the power that's coming out of the, the RTG. And then we spend half of that battery in flight. It takes us, we, we burn it about, we burn about five kilowatt hours in about 30 minutes. Uh, rough order of magnitude, our power consumption is about the same as eight average houses uh, on, on, in the US here. So uh, when we're flying, we could be powering eight homes at the same time. But that's how we do it. We trickle charge a huge battery and then we burn it down when we're flying. Great, thank you. Hey Doug, uh, this is Wagata. Um, I'll be reading uh, some questions from the board uh, that came okay. up. Sounds good. Uh, so, all right. So um, one of the questions uh, from Chris Silva is, um, uh, what are the science instrumentation power and computing needs? Okay, so <clears throat> so first of all, just kind of a humorous thing. Um, those of you that have looked into spacecraft know that we fly on 1990s technology. The the, the CPU that we fly is was state of the art in like 1992 or something like that. It's um, an RS6000 chip based architecture. Um, it's now a RAD 750, so it's better than an RS6000, but it's very old tech. And the reason for that is it's radiation hardened and there's a limited market for radiation hardened tech. So the computer that we fly is not particularly powerful. Uh, there's not a lot of computing that goes on in the science instruments themselves. And what computing is done is typically done within the avionics of the science instrument. 
um, for instance, the mass spectrometer does its does its own um, processing on board. So we have a just real quick, we have a mass spectrometer called DRAMS. We have a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer called Dragons. We have a uh, meteor meteorologic and seismic suite called DragMet. Uh, let's see, and then there's Dragon Cam, which is our, our our camera suite. We also have a thing called Draco, which is the thing we sample the surface from. In any case, the the to summarize that succinctly, the the instruments do most of their own computations. Um, there is some commanding that's done from the, the lander proper, but there's not a lot of heavy duty compute power on board. Most of the heavy duty compute power is on earth. So we we do uh, what we'll call triage processing in situ and then transmit the data to earth. Okay, thanks. Uh, our next question um, uh, is from Fernando. Um, is there a particular challenge uh, with the uh, landing gear uh, ah, due to the yeah. properties of the surface of Titan? Good question. You guys have good questions. <laughs> um, so the uh, there's two things about the landing gear that are challenged. One is the surface, as indicated. We have very little knowledge of what the surface of Titan is like. Basically, the only thing we really know anything significant about is the little tiny area that the Huygens probe landed in. Uh, we have models and, and some basic understanding of, of uh, you know, sand, uh, sand saltation, how, how sand moves here on Earth, um, and we know the we know the kinds of materials that make up the sands on Titan, so we can we can estimate what the surface looks like. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, we have to be very robust to uncertainty there. So we have to make the skids fairly wide. Uh, we chose skids for aerodynamic reasons to reduce the drag in flight, um, but we have to make them fairly wide, kind of, you know, think snowshoe so that we don't sink too far in if we land. And that leads to the sunny point number two is that uh, it's tricky. You know, we don't have a pilot on board, so we have to have a system that can detect the surface well enough and control its uh, velocity into the surface. It's, it's a very low speed collision, but it's still a collision. Uh, the current version of the lander has some pneumatic shocks on the skids, which are filled with the Titan air. It's kind of a, a clever idea where the, when we take off the, the shocks, kind of they, they extend below the lander and, and pull in air. Uh, and then when you land, it expels the air and gives you some damping when you land. Um, but uh, those are very helpful in, in taking out errors that we might make. But if we're able to get the errors small enough, we might be able to uh, reduce or, or even possibly eliminate the need for those dampers. But it's a combination of the two is the, the uncertainty in the surface properties and the need to have very low loads when you land, because you have to do it again, not just once, you have to do it 40 times. Um, so we can't, we can't have crushables or other deformable elements to absorb energy. We have to, we have to have a repeatable system. So. All right, thanks. Uh, so our next question uh, uh, comes, um, are there any considerations for corrosion or erosion due uh, to the atmosphere or uh, precipitation on Titan? Good question, again. So uh, the short answer is no. Um, the, uh, again, the cycle we have on Titan is a methane cycle and methane's at least for most things, uh, chemically inert. I can't say it's chemically inert for everything, of course, but there is no oxygen in the atmosphere, uh, at least not any meaningful level of it. Um, and again, it's extremely dry because there's no water. It's so cold that any any water is precipitated out. Uh, so there's very little corrosion risk. Uh, in fact, we're not even really concerned about corrosion at all. However, uh, interestingly enough, what that does do is it means that uh, we have to be careful about static electricity because there's no water to burn off static charge. So everything has to be grounded. Uh, if you remember the, the kind, of shot, kind of shiny outer surface of the lander, that's to make the outer surface conductive so that we don't build up static charge on, on the insulation that would lead to a static discharge and could be a bad thing. We even uh had planned to put uh, static wicks on the rotors for instance to make sure they don't build up static charge so uh, static electricity is a challenge for us and and uh we think we can defeat it but the point is you can't ignore it uh, because of the dry atmosphere 
Lastly, on the rain, the interesting thing about that is that it's not so much a corrosion risk as it is, uh, it does two things. It can, it can cause migration of uh, debris, like if you have dust in the atmosphere, it can, you know, the dust can infiltrate into the lander. Um, but strangely enough, what it is, is actually a thermal risk because if you have a, uh, if you have, let's say a, a leak, you know, a leaky roof and it's dripping into the lander, what it's doing really is freezing the lander because the interior of the lander is about zero C. And of course the exterior is minus 180 C. So you're, you're dripping some, a very cold fluid in there. So if it actually were to rain on us and, and we, we didn't have uh, measures in place to guard against the rain, then we could have a thermal problem. So we actually have a requirement for the mission to be uh, basically be tolerant of rain. We, we, we don't allow any open uh, openings on the top of the lander where, where a liquid could penetrate the lander. It all has to be, you know, have a runoff kind of capability. Yeah, Doug, if okay, I could jump thanks. in here real quick off that conversation. Um, being as this is remotely controlled, how does it handle uh, when storms approach? Does it somehow sense uh, the winds coming up and then decide to land? You guys have, you're really stringing the questions. Yeah, that's great. So uh, yeah, that's a natural segue. And thank you for that segue. In fact, actually, I thought of it as I was uh, speaking a second ago. So um, the good news is, is Titan is nearly isothermal. Like the, the day night temperature might vary by one degree Celsius or something like that. It's very, very isothermal because it has that 1200 kilometer thick atmosphere full of methane and methane is a greenhouse gas. So even though not a lot of uh, sunlight gets to Titan, you know, about 1% of earth on a, on a flux basis, um, it, uh, it homogenizes it very well. It's very diffuse across the surface and it holds what heat it gets very well. So it, the, the whole surface is kind of this uniform temperature. And what that means is that there isn't a whole lot of convection in the atmosphere. You know, we see these massive thunderstorms on earth here because we have a ton of water and a bunch of solar heating. And so it's a very energetic atmosphere. There's just not a lot of energy in the Titan atmosphere. And I showed you a picture of a, of, of a cloud and, and I guess the point there is that it's not that there's zero energy in the Titan atmosphere, you get some, but it's it's more muted compared to Earth. So the real trick is that what we do, um, our flights are relatively short, again, order of 30 minutes. And they're in the late morning, we typically fly, we plan to fly about uh, nine o'clock local solar time. So the sun's, you know, 45 degrees up uh, from, from sunrise. Um, so the atmosphere should be relatively quiet in the morning. It's not, you know, e even on a Titan basis. And the other thing that we do is before we fly, we have a pre-flight checklist. We have wind sensors on board that we use uh, to check for wind. And those same sensors, if it were actually raining, would detect a massive, they're, they're uh, thermal sensors they, they use to, to measure. Uh, it's kind of like a, a hot wire anemometer or something like that, you know, the same technology. So if it's raining, you're going to detect a massive uh, change and, and you'll know not to fly. So we do a pre, part of our autonomous pre-flight check is to, you know, check the wind, make sure it's all okay, make sure it's not raining, uh, make sure every, all the systems are healthy, and then it gives itself the green light and goes. Uh, if, if any of those things fail, then it reports home that the wind was too high or I thought it was raining or whatever, and then we, uh, we have our backup opportunities, or we can wait a day uh, to fly again. A day being a tight sol. Thanks, Doug. Impressed. All right. So um, I think that covered it. Uh, so continuing with the questions from our audience. Um, so um, one of our audience was wondering if you could uh, discuss uh, structure and design conditions, such as um, launch, uh, entry to Titan, the most severe landing, most severe flight conditions, uh, you know, with 40 flights, uh, is fatigue a concern? And uh, throws and go Purdue, Purdue University. <laughs> All right, hail Purdue. So um, the uh, good question. So launch loads are on the order of, give or take, six Gs or eight Gs. Uh, Acoustics can be a driver for launch. We have all this foam insulation that's shrouding the lander, and we have to be careful that we don't break any of that off when we're when we're launching. Um, but let's call it 
order of six to eight Gs. Um, and you also have the vibration. It's not just a static load, right? You know, the, the big thing about launch is that, that you get rattled, you know, you, it'll rattle the fillings out of your teeth. And, and so you have to, you have to design to, to uh, not be driven crazy by, by a launch and you don't want to hit a resonance. Uh, some launch vehicles have what's called a pogo mode, um, which you can look up and read about, but it basically it sets up a standing wave in the, uh, in the fuel of the rocket. Um, it's actually a pressure wave that feeds into the engine and there's a feedback cycle. And it was a, a big famous thing for the Saturn V rocket that they figured out how to defeat the pogo mode. Uh, but you, the, anyway, the launch is a vibratory environment, a vibro, vibroacoustic environment that also has a, a quasi-static load. But the, the big quasi-static load is actually entry. Uh, our current, and I expect this to be uh, likely to just stay with us, it's working pretty well. Uh, current entry load design case is 12 Gs. So we hit the atmosphere and we can des decelerate as high as 12 Gs. Uh, the parachute loading is strangely enough, very low because uh, again, we need to fall through the atmosphere. So that drogue chute is relatively small, uh, probably only talking about maybe one G when you, when you deploy that. And the main, when we deploy that, we're almost at a standstill. In fact, we're deploying it so low uh, that we're gonna have to do fruit scale atmospheric testing here on earth uh, to account for the, the very low speed opening uh, and the loads are gonna be very, very light. So flight loads, uh, there, there are two things about flight uh, from a structure's perspective that are particularly interesting. Not to say that there aren't others, but there's two that are particularly interesting. One of them is the, the landing. And we've already discussed that, um, is that depending on the speed that you hit the ground and the orientation you hit the ground, you can, you can have loads there. Kind of uh, an interesting twist to this is, uh, and this, uh, is, is a good mantra to remember is careful what you wish for. So if we found a nice flat landing site and we touch down in a perfectly level attitude, that's actually very high loads, right? Because you don't have any inertial relief. You're just kind of pounding, you know, it's like if you fell over in, in your yard, if you, if you don't brace for it, if you just fall over pancake flat, you hit the ground really hard. Well, the same thing is if we, if we hit the ground just perfectly flat, which we're trying to do, uh, then you actually end up generating very high loads when you do that. So you have to be careful. Uh, you control, you basically control the loads with your velocity. But you know, if you put a tilde in front of it, you can think like a 5G load is a worst case. Um, at least we're hoping to do better than that. But uh, uh, as things stand, it's tilde 5Gs order of that. Flying itself, there are two things about flying. Uh, one is that you're, you're basically limited by what force the rotors can generate in terms of a static load. There's only so much power that you can put into the rotor. Uh, we're limited on how many amps we can pull out of the battery. Uh, we have a very big battery, but you're still limited. You can't pull infinite amps out of it. Because uh, if you did, you'd either burn up the motors or you'd blow up the battery. So there's only so much you can put into the rotors. And, and unless you're doing something like aerobatic maneuvers, it's hard to generate really high loads on the rotors when you're flying. Because we, we fly like a 747 does. We just take off and just kind of, you know, pound through the air. We're, we're not looking to do anything fancy. We just want to get from A to B. Uh, so we want our passengers to be very relaxed when we're flying. Um, but the other thing that you have is, is a resonance. And, and this is an interesting part. And, and again, for VFS, um, we have we have fixed pitch rotors. The, the Mars helicopter ingenuity was a real helicopter, you know, contra rotating blades with a swash plate and a cyclic and a collective actuators. Uh, we are a copter, a, a multi-rotor copter with fixed pitch blades. And what that means is we suffer resonances when we fly. Uh, we're not able to um, hold a constant speed on the rotors. We have to vary the speed of the rotors to generate both thrust and control. And when we fly forward, of course, you get the one per rev from an imbalance, and then you get two per and four per revs with our X8 configuration with the interactions between the rotors. Those resonances are a trick. Uh, and that's actually one of the design cases we're working right now uh, is to uh, develop a structure that can allow the rotors to spin at the speeds we need to, the variable speeds that we need to generate the thrust that we need to uh, and not resonate with the structure to drive the structure crazy. Okay, uh, thanks. That must have been uh, a so Trish question. <laughs> it was a Doug Trish question. Yeah. Yes, it does. Well it does bring up the idea of a follow-on question, and that is the the concepts of the resonance between the eight rotors and uh, both from a structural standpoint and a ground contact standpoint. 
uh, do you have notch filters built into your control system to help uh, eliminate them and detect and eliminate them? So the problem is, uh, and that's that's an interesting question. So uh, I'll offer this: the, the trouble with notching your controller is that we rely on variable speeds for control. So if you say, for instance, you're not allowed to spin at 800 RPM, uh, that means that you you are the controller will constantly have to be jumping to and from that RPM to make you know you, you'd actually have to design your whole flight. To never require 800 RPM, uh, it becomes very difficult to notch the controller itself. Um, instead, what you try to do is you try to design the, the system so that the you, you just have free, general frequency separation. It's very it's not that it can't be done. I mean, certainly you know, especially if we had a, a helicopter, right? You could um, you could design a structure around a very narrow frequency range that the helicopter is going to fly in, but but for us, we 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 suffer, and and this is a pro and a con. By the way, we, the reason we picked the um, and you even saw that the, the first proposal in 2000 was a helicopter. The reason we picked the multi rotor instead of the helicopter was just the environment and the complexity. It's a very dusty environment, extremely cold. It's hard to uh, maintain that mechanism over a long surface mission. Uh, the helicopter mechanisms when it's exposed naked to the environment and and we don't have any way. To, to make repairs. So the, the we, we pay the price of, of having to deal with the variable speed fix, fixed pitch rotor in order to reap the benefit of the simplicity of, of just one degree freedom actuators uh, that, that are long, will be long lived on the surface. Good answer, thank you. All right, um, moving on to another question. Um, this is from Bill Welsh. Is the flight computer triplex redundant? Ah, good question. Mm. Bill, you've you've managed to hit one of my sore spots. Um, what I would really like is to say yes, but the answer is no. So the 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 way to go, the the, the right way to do this is three or even four. Uh, famously, the space shuttle was quintuple redundant, right? It had four primaries and a backup, so. Uh, but that's what you do when you fly something that weighs a quarter million pounds and is worth more than its weight in gold. You you, you have very redundant systems, uh, fault masking systems. We do not. What we have is we have an A side and a B side uh, system. And if the A side goes down, then we swap to the B side. We do a hot swap. So both sides are running full up uh, navigation and attitude control solutions uh, so that you don't have to transfer information. They, they have independent solutions that are... Uh, that are not linked to each other. They're, they're, uh, now they may use the same sensor. For instance, they may both draw information from the same IMU if we've lost one of the IMUs as a for instance. Um, but uh, what has to happen is that if, if you get a, an upset, one of them goes belly up, then you have to switch to the other one. And we have a requirement for how fast that happens. And it turns out that interestingly enough, uh, our simulations are were relatively robust to that time. It's you don't have to do it right away. You you have a, a little bit, you know, you can kind of take a breath and, and and switch to the other side. So we are not triplex redundant, even though that would really be the way to go. Uh, we have an A side, B side architecture. All right, thanks. Uh, so we have about um, eight more questions. Um, we could do um, two more. Um, or if, um, Doug, are you available to, um, stick around a little longer? I can say as long as I want, as long as you want, uh, I, I can also start giving shorter answers. <laughs> oh, uh, why don't we do, uh, five questions? So God, why don't you, uh, end it here with the last five, pick the best five. Okay. All right. So this question is from Jayanth, uh, Krishnamurthy. Uh, would you be able to address in more detail some of the challenges of designing uh, the rotorcraft to fly in Titan as opposed to Mars? So there's a few. Um, specific to Mars, uh, the one thing that the biggest one that I'll, relative to Mars uh, is that we know a boatload about Mars. You know, we've had spacecraft that have landed there, you know, Viking landed. In the 70s, and we've had a, a you know a bunch of landers recently, so we know all about the atmosphere, we know all about the surface. We have 
images of the surface uh, when famously when Perseverance landed, um, they had imaged every rock in the landing ellipse. They they knew every hazard, and and, and so uh, they knew exactly where to fly. Uh, they have very bright sunlight, very sharp relief shadows. If you want if you want to do optical navigation as as an ingenuity helicopter is is doing. The thing they don't have is a very good atmosphere. It's very thin CO2 atmosphere. Um, but in terms of challenges, the, the big thing is that we know very little about Titan, right? Is it, 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 and that's, I'll guess the other thing is the thermal environment is that Mar yeah, it gets cold on Mars at, at night, but it's very thin atmosphere. So if you, you know, you can basically put uh, what's called MLI, multi-layer insulation, you, you put blankets on, on it. And uh, that's how they're able to make the Ingenuity helicopter so small and light is it doesn't require a bunch of, bunch of uh, insulation and they can, you know, they have solar cells, they can generate solar electricity. We don't have any solar energy. We have to bring a nuclear power source. It's bitter cold, so we have to use that nuclear power source to keep us warm. And we know next to nothing about the environment. Those are the, the big three challenges that we have. Uh, I'll add one more, which is that it's it was surprisingly straightforward for them to do actual flight tests of a uh, gravity offloaded copter in the 25 foot chamber at JPL. They, they backfilled it with a 1% CO2 atmosphere and they put a little spring on top to, to kind of offload one Earth gravity, and they were able to fly the copter in near Mars-like conditions. Uh, as I discussed earlier, we, it's very difficult for us to do that um, in a true flight-like sense. You know, we can't match density, temperature, and pressure and fly something in any meaningful ways. So, so our challenge is building to flight capability without ever actually flying it. All right. Uh, to piggyback off that uh, question, uh, one from John Bilkowski. Uh, what lessons learned from Ingenuity are you incorporating into Dragonfly? So the um, <clears throat> there's a I'll, I'll just make an observation, and it's fairly straightforward. But if if you've been following Ingenuity, you'll know that the first flight they flew to 10 feet, and the second flight they flew to 15 feet or 16 feet, and then the third flight they actually covered a distance. You know. Crawl, walk, run, it, it's basically on display with Ingenuity. We're going to have to do the same thing with Dragonfly. We're going to have to stick the first landing. Uh, and then once we're on the ground, we're going to have to be very careful about commissioning the spacecraft to fly in the Titan environment and do, to do the exploration flights. So, so that's more of an observation. Uh, in terms of lessons learned, I think this may be not the answer you're looking for, but uh, it is an important one, which is the, the, we're very friendly with the Mars helicopter team. We, we're, by the way, we're extremely excited that they're they're successful. Uh, double thumbs up, congratulations to that team, um, our our comrades on Mars. Uh, but the uh, one of the things that they were, they were very kind and they shared with us was uh, their again. I'll get back to the verification. They had a verification matrix. I mentioned the tests in the 25 foot chamber. There there were a bunch of other things that were done to verify that the system would work in situ. And the lessons learned that, that I think have been the most important to us thus far is actually the development process that the Mars helicopter went through, uh, and because we have to follow something very similar, uh, again, with our own limitations. All right. Uh, so uh, our next question comes from Fernando Neves. Uh, he's asking, he's curious about um, how the structural integrity uh, of the craft uh, can be monitored over the during the five six years uh, <laughs> period. Uh, I'm going to give you a flippant answer. Rotors stay on, it talks to you. Rotors fall off, it doesn't talk to you. So you know, it, we uh, we can get some data from the IMU uh, to you know kind of give us a if we if we download raw IMU data, we can get a frequency content and understand what's going on. We don't currently have planned any engineering sensors for structural health. Um, it's not impossible. We could put some sensors out there, but the tricky thing there is recall again, your sensor has to survive the environment. So if you put an acceler accelerometer out there, it has to work at 94 Kelvin. Now there are accelerometers that'll do that, um, but it's just a, a consideration. You could put strain gauges on there, but now you're generating more data and are you going to use that data? It's just engineering and, and doesn't have a science return. So it becomes 
unpopular unless you have some sort of something you can do about it, right? You know, if there's if you observe some behavior that you think you can mitigate uh, remotely with the data that you collect, then you know you can put in a sensor to detect that. But um, the joke being, if you have a sensor to detect when the wings fall off, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good because the wings fell off, so it, it's over. Um, but that's not to say we couldn't do something. It's just I don't believe we're currently planning to do any direct health monitoring uh, when we're on Titan. All right. Uh, next question uh, comes from John Daniel, um, and he's asking, uh, "Will cameras be functioning during descent?" Um, so, you see, this question is based because of the Perseverance video. I'm assuming uh, those of you. I, I think probably everybody on the phone has seen it, but it. If you haven't seen it, go look up the, the entry, descent, and landing video from Perseverance. It's amazing. So uh, the, the answer is sort of yes, but with a qualifier. It's going to be not unlike Perseverance. We don't see anything at all until the heat shield comes off. So once you're under the main parachute and you drop the heat shield, then your cameras are exposed and you can start to see. And that's the same thing with Perseverance because you, you just can't risk uh, having a camera uh, you know, that has to penetrate through the TPS. Now, Perseverance had uplook cameras, the pucks, parachute uplook cameras, um, that were exposed when they when they fired the mortar, it blew the, the, the lid off the, the parachute closeout cone so that they could see the parachute. But in terms of, for us on Dragonfly, what we will be able to see is the, the cameras looking down at the surface and forward. So we have forward and downward looking cameras when we come off the back shell, do the mid-air deployment and start flying. So. We expect to record images all the way to the surface. Uh, and if uh, if I get my wish, then we're gonna download them all and make a movie for the public to see. So that, but that's the answer. All right, we'll be looking forward to that. Indeed. Uh, so, so our last question and um, um, I, I think, um, yeah, uh, forgive me if you answer this already, but uh, this is from Pedro. Cabrera. Um, so it looks like the rover uh, will be deployed while descending on parachute. Uh, this is different uh, from the Mars helicopter. Why not uh, land uh, before uh, deploying it? Good. So <clears throat> this gets back to, and there were some questions earlier about how, you know, how do you come up with Dragonfly? How do you make this thing? Well, we, um, I'll just state for the record that we literally started with a blank sheet of paper in 2016. It was just this idea and we just started drawing how it might work. And one of the challenges we had was exactly this. How do you get it onto the surface? Well, you know, again, if you followed the Mars program, Viking was a powered lander and then along came uh, Mars Pathfinder, an airbag landing. Um, it was followed up by a uh, very unfortunate mission that, that had some trouble and didn't make it to the surface. Mars Polar Lander, that was another powered lander. But then they went back to airbags. So you went airbags for Mars Pathfinder and then both Mars Exploration Rover missions had airbag landings. The next landing after that was Phoenix, it was Powered Lander. And, and then you get into MSL on Mars 2020, which have the sky crane landing. Um, <clears throat> that's the setup for this. The, the, the issue we have on Dragonfly is it's in the New Frontiers program. It's we, New Frontiers 4, we won the New Frontiers 4 competition. Um, that's a cost cap mission. So we can't do things that cost a lot of money um, unless we absolutely have to. And the challenge is that if, if you were, for instance, just to alight on the surface under parachute, well, you have the problem that the parachute can land on you or, uh, and, and you still have the back shell attached to your back. So, but what if you separate from the back shell and then you have a parachute, why don't you, well, you, then you still have that, what we call the draping problem. The parachute can drape over the lander. Uh, or it could drag the lander across the surface, or it could entangle the rotors. There's all sorts of things that are, are a risk to something that, you know, like a bunch of lawnmower blades spinning around, you don't have a bunch of ropes out there. So, so you have to get away from that parachute, you have to get away from the back shell somehow. Airbag landing is kind of out of the question because the, the volume required to do that is just way too high. Uh, you could do something like MSL and uh, Perseverance did, and you could have a sky crane, you could have a rocket powered sky crane to fly your lander and land it down on the surface. But that begs the question, why bother? Because you've already built a lander that's designed to fly around and land on the surface. So that all boils back to the, the, uh, the concept that you saw that, that we discussed tonight. 
which is we built a lander to explore Titan. We are exploiting that capability to execute the first landing and weirdly enough, simplify the system. We don't have to have, we don't have, we, we can separate ourselves and divorce ourselves from the parachute in the back shell. We don't have to have any, you know, an additional element like a power descent stage. And, uh, you know, we're taking advantage of what's built into the system. So that's, that's why it's done that way. Well, that's really awesome. Uh, some innovation going on. Some, some pretty, uh, 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 well, uh, thought, thought provoking challenges there. Yeah. Now all we have uh, so to do is dealt- make it, now all we have to do is make it work. Right. So how hard can that be? <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks. That that ends it for the questions. Doug, right. I gotta say thank you so much. It was a great presentation today. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys are hiring or you know, I'm just kidding. Uh Andy's on the call. <laughs> but the um uh I just wanted to say thank you first of all to the audience. I, I think that you know the questions tonight were really excellent. I appreciate you all staying uh through to seven o'clock. And Doug, you know, uh on the short notice we gave you Really amazing presentation. Um, really got me excited for you know what we have coming uh, for the United States and space exploration, and uh, just amazing. Hopefully we can uh, reach out to you guys again and collaborate on some other efforts here in the future. Appreciate your, your time tonight. Absolutely, and I, I will offer my own thanks uh, to everyone who attended. It's it's fun to talk, and I will say uh, with with no hesitation that was the best set of questions I've ever gotten. You guys really knew what to ask. That's really well done. So. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you guys when we have the opportunity. Absolutely. Thanks again, Doug. Hey, good luck on the mission. Thank you. Yep. Good luck. Well, thank you everybody. Thanks. Have a great night and uh, hopefully we'll see you for either tech snacks or in the fall when we continue the webinar series. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.